Before we delve into quantum mechanics, I'd like to talk about the need to abandon classical mechanics. The standard story is that classical mechanics is perfectly self-consistent, but it's just not the way our world works. Our universe could have been a classical universe, but it's not the case. Classical mechanics fails experimentally, and there is no more to be said. That is, as I said, the standard story, and I don't believe it's the correct way to look at things. I believe that classical mechanics is based on assumptions that, in the end, are problematic. They work well in some regimes, but they're bound to break down. So the mathematics is perfectly fine, but the physical assumptions upon which the mathematics is based are not so fine. I believe that understanding why and how classical mechanics fails at a conceptual level is key to understanding what quantum mechanics uh, describes, what quantum mechanics is there to fix. And again, this is my personal view, but I find that it helps. So this is what I'm going to talk about in this video. Why does classical mechanics fail? What are the fundamental problems the theory has that make it ultimately not give the correct picture of the world? Let's start from the basics. Say we want to study a system, any system, either classical or quantum or thermodynamics, it doesn't matter. The first thing we need to do is to define its boundaries. We need to say what is part of the system and what is not part of the system. But that's not enough. We also need to define what happens at the boundary because it turns out that what happens at the boundary determines what states can be defined for the system, what can be studied. So let's go through a couple of examples to see what I mean. Suppose we want to study the motion of a cannonball, classic physics problem. As the cannonball moves through the air, air molecules will scatter off its surface. However, given the mass of the cannonball, in most circumstances the effect will be negligible. So the state of the cannonballs can be taken to be a precise value of position and momentum. Now suppose that we want to study the motion of a speck of dust. Like before, air will scatter off its surface, but in this case, the effect will not be negligible. Each impact will make the speck jiggle in some direction. The state of the speck of dust will be taken to be a probability distribution over position and momentum. Lastly, suppose we want to study the motion of a cannonball on the surface of the sun. This time, plasma will scatter off its surface and the effect will not be negligible at all. They will be catastrophic. The cannonball will melt and cease to exist, it will disperse and will become part of the rest of the system. It is not even clear to me whether we can keep track of which particles belong to the cannonball in the first place. The point here is that interaction at the boundary is important for the very definition of a system. The way they describe the system, its state, is context dependent. Talking about a particular system with a particular state already implies we have made some assumption on the system environment boundary. Classical mechanics assumes objects, at least in some conditions, can be adequately isolated, that the interaction with the environment is negligible. This is what allows us to describe the system as an infinitely precise quantity plus a perturbation on top. Even when we have noise, we always assume that, in principle, we can turn it off. We can put the speck of dust in a vacuum. We can, at least in principle, measure the naked x, the naked value of the property. And unfortunately, this view is so ingrained in our head, and this is the hard bit, that our instinct is to think there is always a true, infinitely precise value. Even if the noise cannot be eliminated, even if we can't measure it. But that's not how it works. If we are outside of the realm of the assumption, we can't use the model. The model is based on the assumption. We would have to use something else, which is going to be based on different assumption, different moralistic characterization of the system environment boundary. Now, complete isolation is not the only assumption in classical mechanics. Classical mechanics also assume we can study parts of the objects as small as we want with infinite precision. The motion of every infinitesimal drop of a fluid, of the tiniest electromagnetic wave packet, is fully specified, and this is ultimately the problem. These two assumptions are clearly in tension. While I may say that an object as a whole is adequately isolated, 
The smaller the part I consider, the greater the effect of the boundary interaction on that part. At some points, parts are going to be so small that isolation breaks down, and we have to take into account the interaction at the boundary. Classical mechanics fails because we can never completely isolate a system at all scales. There is always some interaction with the environment that cannot be eliminated. On practical grounds, we can perfectly isolate a system, but it's more than that. On theoretical grounds, we cannot shield the gravitational interaction or eliminate thermal radiation, so we will always have something. Even worse, Complete isolation does not make sense on logical grounds. Complete isolation means no possible interaction with the system. If you send a signal, a probe, that would pass through. We cannot make any measurement. Effectively, the system has disappeared from our physically accessible universe. So, what is it that we're talking about? Because complete isolation is not possible, the most accurate description must ultimately be statistical, probabilistic in nature. So we have to abandon the classical world where the state is a set of infinitely precise quantities. Regardless of whether we know quantum mechanics exists or whether quantum mechanics is the best theory we can ever have, we still have to abandon the classical world. Now this argument makes a lot of sense to me. It tells me why, ultimately, our physical theories cannot be classical. It clarifies something based on the nature of scientific investigation, which are the sort of arguments I like best. But I always like to have more than one argument, so let's proceed in another direction, though ultimately we'll see that it's still the same problem disguised in a different form. Let's start with a simple question. What is the entropy of a pure microstate in classical statistical mechanics? That is, the entropy of a state where the position and momentum of all particles is perfectly specified. Many of you will instinctively say zero, and unfortunately, it is not the correct answer. So let's go through the motion and calculate it. There are two main definitions of entropy used in classical mechanics. There is the logarithm of the accessible microstates and the Gibbs-Shannon entropy. So let's calculate using both. Note that the accessible microstates are measured in terms of the phase space volume, not the number of microstates. If you take any finite volume, you have infinitely many points, so the entropy would be infinite if you counted the microstates. So that doesn't work. So what is the phase space volume for a single microstate? Zero, of course, no volume. So the entropy is the logarithm of zero, which is minus infinity. Now let's double check using the Gibbs Shannon entropy to see if it agrees. Since our distribution is a single microstate, it is a delta function. The probability density is zero everywhere except on the correct microstate, for which it is infinite. The only contribution to the entropy is where the distribution is infinite. So minus infinity, times the logarithm of infinity will give us minus infinity. So both expressions agree. The entropy of a pure microstate in classical mechanics is minus infinity. It doesn't sound very good, but is it a problem? Well, let's see. Recall the third law of thermodynamics. It says that every system has a positive finite entropy and that the entropy of a perfect crystal at absolute zero temperature is zero. Clearly, we have a problem here. A classical perfect crystal means nothing is changing, so we only have a single microstate, which means the entropy is minus infinity, not zero. So classical mechanics is inconsistent with the third law of thermodynamics. But the third law kind of uh, always feels tacked on to thermodynamics, so maybe it's not such a big problem. Okay, let's consider the second law of thermodynamics. We cannot create an engine that converts heat into work without increasing entropy. The system as a whole, including the thermal sources and sinks, must see its entropy increase. But if we have a system whose entropy is minus infinity, we have a loophole, we can cheat. Since minus infinity plus any finite number is still minus infinity, we can dump the entropy increase of our engine into the minus infinity entropy system. The engine, the sources, and the sinks go back where they were. 
So we broke the second law. So having a system with minus infinite entropy is not good at all. However, some claim that thermodynamic laws are just phenomenological. They're not real law. So who cares if they're broken? Okay, so let's look at it from another angle. What is zero entropy anyway? Well, we know entropy is additive for independent system. So the entropy of A and B is equal to the entropy of A plus the entropy of B. This is true also for the Shannon entropy, which is purely information theoretic. So we don't need the technical thermodynamics here, it's just ideas from information theory. Now the empty system, the one that contains nothing, acts as a zero under system combination. If we take any system and combine it with nothing, we get the original system. If you like math, the set of all systems is a monoid under system combination, and the empty system is the unit. Now, because entropy is additive, the entropy of the empty system must be zero. So zero has a much more direct logical meaning than the entropy of a crystal. It's the entropy of the system with nothing in it. Note that there is only one way for the empty system to be, and it is a complete description. Once we say the system is not there, we know everything we would possibly want to know about the state of the system. So entropy lower than zero would correspond to a description that is more refined, more precise than that of an empty system. Think about it. I give you a state whose description is more precise than if I told you that the system wasn't there. But we just said that if I tell you the system is not there, I fully describe the system. And that makes no sense. So from an information theory perspective, no system can have entropy lower than zero. It's logically inconsistent. So classical mechanics fails because it allows for the possibility of statistical ensembles that can never exist, those with minus infinite entropy. On practical ground, we could bypass the second law with all its implication. On theoretical grounds, these ensembles do not respect the third law. And on logical grounds, they would provide more information about the system than stating that the system does not exist. Now, as a side note, quantum mechanics fixes this. In quantum mechanics, all pure states have zero entropy, including the vacuum, the empty system. Now, I want to stress that these entropic arguments are not independent from the isolation argument. Thermodynamics as a physical theory is exactly about describing what happens across the boundary. Heat and work are energy exchanges by one system to another. Perfect control of a system is effectively Maxwell's demos in disguise. Moreover, if you studied any communication theory, you know that the channel capacity is given by the signal-to-noise ratio. In physics terms, the noise is the background interaction of the system with the environment. So that fixes the zero. We can't use the system to encode more information than the background's interaction allows. Saying that we can reduce the interaction with the system as much as we want effectively means setting the noise level to minus infinity. So all these arguments are actually the same argument. We can't fully isolate a system. So classical mechanics fails because it ignores what happens at the boundary of the system. Interaction with the boundary influences state definition, what features of the system are experimentally reachable, the boundary defines the thermodynamics. In certain conditions, we can pretend the system is perfectly isolated, but, but it's pretend. It's a simplifying assumption, an approximation. Now, some of you may be skeptical. The arguments are not that complicated. Why haven't I heard it before? It seems they could have figured out that classical mechanics was wrong uh, even before experimental evidence. So why didn't that happen? Or you may say, well, why can't I simply put the environment into the system, put everything there? Then there is no interaction outside. Now, the answer to all these is basically the same. We inherited from classical mechanics a perspective on what physics is, and unfortunately, this affects us still today. And here is a cartoonish version of it. When classical mechanics was being developed, there was a sense that physicists were discovering the laws of the universe. The mathematical laws, in their rigor and simplicity, describes the universe as it is, as seen by a being that knows everything. It was God's view of the universe. 
We human beings may still have limitations on what we can know in practice, but the laws are true and immutable. Then quantum mechanics happened. The classical laws, perfect in their nature, were substituted by quantum laws, but the God's view perspective was kept, and this created a fundamental puzzle. How can God's view be probabilistic? Surely one and only one thing must happen. What is the mechanism that picks each outcome? Surely God does not play dice. So many have tried to solve this puzzle. In fact, many are still trying to. They may create interpretation that fix quantum mechanics so that we can describe what really happens, so that at least in some sense, God's view is recovered. You see, I don't think the problem is quantum mechanics at all. Quantum mechanics is perfectly fine. The problem, in my totally personal opinion, lies with the God's view perspective. That's what's broken, and I don't think it should be fixed. Personally, I adopt the scientist's view perspective. Here, physics describes what a physicist can study experimentally. It's still objective. The physicist studies something that really exists, but only the thing that can be studied experimentally. And this comes with some constraints. First of all, whatever we study must be experimentally defined and experimentally accessible. We must be able to interact with it independently from the rest. It must be reproducible. And we can't put everything in the system for the simple reason that we, the scientists, in our experimental apparatus must be independent from the system. It must be part of the environment. So in this view, for example, the limited description of a quantum system does not reflect some feature of the universe itself. It simply reflects the limited accessibility we have of the universe. And it's not imperfect knowledge, mind you. It's not that we don't know. It's accessibility, what we can know in principle, what can be known. So that's my view, my approach. And if you don't like it, you're probably not going to like anything I say. And that's fine. My view is that we have to abandon the idea that the laws of physics describe the true and complete nature of the universe. I think that perspective does more harm than good in physics. Ultimately, we are finite beings trying to describe finite objects through experimentation. The laws of physics characterize what we can learn through experimentation. And again, not what we know, not our subjective knowledge. That's the other extreme that also does more harm than good. No, they characterize what can objectively be learned through experimentation in the ideal case. Classical mechanics fails because rests on assumptions that are too simplistic, that we can isolate everything at all scale, that everything can be known and accessed, and that does not work. So, classical mechanics fail. I really believe that the solution to many fundamental questions in physics lies not in asking what is there in the world, but how do we study the world? And that's what our bigger project, Assumption of Physics, is all about.